A mutual broadcasting system presents The Mysterious Traveler. Written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. And starring tonight, two of radio's foremost personalities, Eric Dressler and Brett Morrison in I Died Last Night. This is the mysterious traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. For tonight, our journey is one such as no living man ever took before. We're going to accompany a gentleman named Gregory Raymond across the very threshold of existence into another world. It's a story I call, I Died Last Night. My friend, Mr. Gregory Raymond, who is going to tell you of his strange experience, is a man of middle age with bushy gray hair and the nervous intensity of one who's concentrated his whole life upon a single absorbing interest. As he proceeds with his tale, please overlook the inconsequential fact that he's dead. My name is Gregory Raymond, and it is perfectly true that all my life I was concentrated upon a single interest, the study of death and what comes after it. Even from boyhood, that one interest absorbed me. I made a thousand efforts to penetrate the baffling veil that separates life from death, to effect communication with those on the other side of the dark curtain. And in this effort, I had no success until I met that man of great wisdom from the East, the Yogi Krishna. Then I knew I had found the teacher I needed. I studied daily for months with Krishna and his other pupils. I devoted my entire fortune to the project. And we were just on the brink of success when one evening the yogi kept me with him after the others had left. My friend Gregory, it is necessary that you and I should talk. Of course, yogi. You seem troubled. I am, Gregory. We have come close to success in our studies here, have we not? Closer than I ever dared hope we would. If now we could only tear away the last veil of ignorance that separates us from the truth. If we could only see through to the other side of the wall of death. Patience, my friend. Death is a subject that has engrossed man's mind for a million years. We cannot expect to solve its dark mysteries in a few months. No, of course not, but I've spent a lifetime trying, and I suppose I'm a little impatient. I, too, have spent a lifetime just preparing to make the study. And now that success is in sight, it grieves me to say that we must discontinue our studies. Discontinue them? Just when we were getting somewhere? Well, no, we can't. We have no choice. But why? Why must we stop now when we're so close? For the simplest reason in the world, we lack the money to continue. Oh, money? Is that the trouble? We need trained assistants, scientific instruments, many things to aid us. All this requires money, and we do not have it. Well, uh, how much? Many thousands. A hundred thousand dollars, perhaps. A hundred thousand? It's a lot. But we'll get it. We have to. Alas, my friend... I do not know where. Listen. My brother, John, is a rich man. He's head of the Raymond Foundation, which makes grants for all kinds of important studies. Yes, I have heard so. I'll ask him for the money. For a cause like this, he'll give it to us. I know it. It would mean everything to us. But suppose he refuses? He won't refuse. And if he does, I'll get the money from him somehow. I swear it. The next day, I hurried to Hollywood where John had his home on top of the cliff that looks out over the beach and the ocean beyond. 
When I reached the house, old Charles, the gardener, told me that John had gone for a walk to his favorite spot, a high point on the cliff that looked far out across the ocean. I hurried there and found him alone, smoking and watching the sunset. Swiftly, I told him why I'd come. And to my amazement, he refused my request. Gregory, my answer is emphatically no. I will not put up money for any such crackpot scheme. But, John, you're head of the Raymond Foundation. Father left it millions to carry on research in every field of human welfare. And you consider this wild notion of yours a field of human welfare? Well, of course it is. Don't you understand? We're on the very verge of solving the greatest mystery of all, the mystery of death and what follows mm, it. Indeed, Gregory. But it's true. We only need a little more time and money. Time and money. And when we've succeeded, when we've definitely established communication with those who have left this sphere of existence, think what that will mean to the world. Just what will it mean to the world? Twish. It will mean everything. Think of the... Think of the comfort it will give mankind. The peace of mind. The tranquility of soul that will result when we know what is to come. What our future life is to be like. Can't you see that? No, I'm afraid I can't. Old-fashioned faith is good enough for me. Furthermore, there can never be such communication as you're dreaming of. It's impossible. But it isn't. The yogi Krishna has already achieved it. Your yogi, my dear Gregory, is a fake. I've had him looked up. He's nothing but a trickster and a charlatan, running a nice little racket to get money out of deluded fools like you. That's not true. I tell you it is. While I live, the Raymond Foundation will never furnish a cent for this fantastic scheme. No, John, you can't refuse me. You can't. I do, Gregory. That's final. I see. I'm sorry you said that, John. What do you mean? I see that there's only one thing that I can do. What? What, what the devil are you getting at? This project must not be allowed to fail. It means so much that the life of one man is a small price to pay for that success. Well, what nonsense are you talking? When you're dead, I shall become the head of the Raymond Foundation. Uh, Gregory, get away from me. Take, take your hands off no, me. No, John, you wouldn't listen to reason, so I have no alternative. Gregory, let go of me. You're, you're pushing me through the cliff, Gregory. Believe me, John, I don't want to do this, but Gregory. our studies cannot be allowed to fail. Gregory, come to your senses. You're out of your mind. You'll see, John, in just a moment. You'll know that I'm right. No! No! <laughs> Far below me, John lay still. I felt a vast pity for him, but I had done the only thing possible. And I was sure that John, wherever he might be then, agreed with me. I returned to the house, broke the sad news that John had had an unfortunate accident, and wired for John's son and daughter, Jack and Susan, who were at college, to fly home at once. The next evening, Jack and Susan arrived, pale and upset. I took them into the library to explain the whole sad occurrence to them. Uncle Gregory, you say that Father had a dizzy spell and fell over the cliff before you could catch him. Yes, Jack. It happened so fast I could do nothing. But Father never got dizzy. His health was perfect. He was smoking a cigar, Susan. He complained that he felt a little unwell, and a moment later he staggered and was gone. I feel terribly about this, believe me. You don't look very upset, Uncle Gregory. Oh, but I am, Jack. But I know that wherever your father is now, he's happier by far than any of us. Are you sure that's the reason you're so cheerful, Uncle Gregory? Well, what do you mean by that? She means the gardener tells a very different story. The gardener? What's the gardener got to do with it? He saw you and father talking at the top of the cliff. He says you were arguing. Arguing? Well, that's nonsense. I was just explaining to John my scheme for scientifically attacking the problem of communication with the next world. Uncle Gregory, the gardener says he doesn't think Father fell. Then what does he think? He thinks he saw you push Father off the cliff. That is utter nonsense. He saw me try to grab John as he was falling, that's all. I wish I could believe that, but I can't. Jack, you must. Uncle Gregory couldn't have pushed Father. It just isn't possible. Of course not, Susan, and I'm glad that you at least realize I'm that. not so sure. He seems awfully pleased about being head of the Raymond Foundation now. Now, listen to me, both of you. The coroner says that your father died accidentally, and that ends matters. Not for me, it doesn't. And just what do you think you're going to do, Jack? I don't know yet. 
But I'm going to Dad's lawyers and have you declared incompetent to handle the Raymond Foundation. I warn you, I'll brook no interference. I am head of the Foundation, and from now on, it will be run as I say. Not if I can help it. And the first thing I'm going to do is pour all the resources of the Foundation into an institute for the study of death. Uncle Gregory, you can't mean that. The Foundation scientists are on the verge of a cure for cancer, for tuberculosis. You, you can't stop their work now. I can and I will. No, I'm certain you killed Dad. You killed him to get control of the Foundation for your crazy schemes. You get out. Get out, both of you. Get out. Jack, catch him. He swung at me. He lost his balance. I, I couldn't catch him. He's lying so still. He hit his head on, on the fireplace as he fell. It's bleeding. Jack, is he all right? Just a minute and I'll see. <laughs> Jack bent over me. I had lost my temper and been trying to hit him had fallen. And now I lay on the floor, a great pain throbbing in my head and a strange darkness creeping up all around me. As Jack and Susan leaned over me, the darkness closed in and I felt myself drifting away into an unknown land. And just before the darkness became complete, I could hear their words. Jack, how is he? He, he doesn't seem to be breathing. Is he... Is he dead? Yes, Susan. All his life, Uncle Gregory has been trying to learn what happens when you die. Well, now, at last, he's going to find out. How long I lay in vast dark nothingness, I do not know. But at long last, consciousness began to return to me. First, I realized that the sweet, cloying scent of flowers was heavy in my nostrils. Then I opened my eyes. I lay on a couch at one end of a great dim room with windows of stained glass, like a church. And then at the other end of the room, I saw three coffins. One of the coffins was banked with flowers and candles burned at either end of it. Dazed and bewildered, I got to my feet and walked slowly toward them. I reached the side of the one covered with flowers and stared through the small glass plate at the man inside. And then I knew the body in the coffin was mine. Oh, you mustn't be so upset, mister. Most of us feel pretty startled at first. Yes. Yeah. Joshua and I were upset, just as you are. But it will pass soon. I whirled about and saw two dim figures coming toward me from the shadows. They were smiling, and I knew that they were trying to be helpful. Who... who are you? I'm Joshua Brown. Uh, this is my wife, Nellie. Our bodies are in the other two coffins. Your bodies? are. I don't understand. Of course. You're still confused. That's only natural. Uh, look through the glass in this coffin. That's my body. There, you see? Yes, it... It looks just like you. Yes, of course it is me. Uh, the earthly me. Well, then we're... We're really dead, all three of us? Of course. You died last night. You, you slipped and fell and hit your head. Yes. Yes, I remember now. It's taken you until now to... Well, to become aware of things, to get over the shock. But where am I? Oh, this is the mortuary chapel of the cemetery. They'll be coming for you soon to prepare to bury you. To bury me? No. Oh, you mustn't be upset. Just to bury the mortal you, the empty shell you've left behind. Yes. Nellie and I were killed two nights ago in an auto accident. But we won't be buried until tomorrow, when our son gets here. But I... I never dreamed that it would be like this. Why, I can still see and hear. I still breathe. My heart still beats. Not really. You're used to those things, so they let you think there hasn't been much change until you get over your first shock. They're very thoughtful. They? Who do you mean? The ones in charge. Oh, you'll know more about them soon. Mr. Benedict will be coming for us, and I expect he'll take you along, too. Who's Mr. Benedict? He's our guide. He stopped last night to tell us not to worry and to wait for him. He'll take us on to the next place. Oh, shh. 
someone's coming. We must step back here, out of the way. We stepped back a few paces as the door opened. Four men entered, pushing a carriage on rubber tired wheels. Behind them came Jack and Susan dressed in mourning. They advanced toward the coffin, the coffin that held my mortal body. All right, men, take it easy now. That's it. All lift together. They lifted and placed the coffin on the wheeled carriage that they brought. And a sudden panic struck me, a sudden fear that made me cry out. Jack! Susan! No, you mustn't. You can't bury me. I, I'm not dead. I can't be. Oh, please, you mustn't give way. It's perfectly natural, really, it is. No, let go of me. I've got to make them understand that I'm not really dead. Let go of me. Jack! Susan! Please, please, you mustn't distress yourself. You see, they can't hear you. It was true. None of them so much as turned. The four men wheeled my coffin out. Jack and Susan followed, and the door closed. I was alone again with the Browns. They didn't hear me. They didn't pay any attention to me. It was impossible for them to hear you. We cannot communicate with the living, nor they with us. But it must be possible. I'm sorry, but really it isn't. Mr. Benedict said so. But all my life I've worked to establish such communication, and now I have so much to tell the world. The people that I've worked with, Yogi Krishna, I, I must tell them all this. I must reach them somehow. But if it is possible, Mr. Benedict will tell you, I'm sure. Now, now, please, the only thing we can do is be quiet and wait for him. Stunned, I sank into a chair. There was no doubt about it. I had died last night, and this was what came after. But I knew the Browns were wrong. There was some way to reach the ones that I'd left behind. I knew the yogi had proved it to me. And so I waited for Mr. Benedict. I don't know how long it was, but suddenly a strange musical note sang in my ears. I looked up. A shaft of white light shone directly down into the center of the room. And in it stood a tall figure hidden in a flowing robe. The light winked out, and the figure strode toward us. Are you ready, Mr. and Mrs. Brown? Yes, Mr. Benedict. Oh, Mr. Raymond, this is Mr. Benedict. He's come for us now. Yes, it is time. We must go. But I can't go yet. I've got to tell people, the, the people that I've worked with, we've worked so hard to find out the truth, and now... It may not be. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, it is time. Sure, Mr. Benedict, we're ready. But uh, Mr. Raymond is coming with us, isn't he? He is not coming. Not coming? But uh, why, Mr. Benedict? He is doomed to remain here on Earth for all eternity. What do you mean? What are you saying? This is your punishment. To remain forever a spirit that moves unseen and unheard among men. Why is he being punished, Mr. Benedict? He knows. That is sufficient. Now come, we must go. No, wait. You've got to take me with you. But they didn't wait. They took a step, two steps, and were gone. Where they'd vanished, heavy curtains rustled against the wall. I rushed over to them and flung them back. There was no wall. I could see straight out into a peaceful cemetery and across the green grass, Mr. Benedict and the Browns were walking away. I hurried after them and something stopped me. An invisible barrier across my path, cold, unyielding, like glass. I beat against the invisible barrier with my hands. I cried out and no one heard, no one noticed. And at last, exhausted, I ceased. Jack and Susan were slowly walking toward me. They came down a little path and stopped not five feet from me, yet they did not see me. And they were talking about me. Well, it's all over, Susan. Uncle Greg and Father are both gone. 
We've got to face the fact. I know, Jack, but do you think Uncle really did kill Father? I don't want to believe it. Well, I guess we'll never know. But if he did, he's been punished for it. Perhaps this punishment is worse than we can ever guess. Do you suppose that now, wherever he is, he's he's trying to tell the world what he knows? Probably, Susan. But if only Gregory hadn't become such a fanatic on the subject, none of this would ever have happened. They started to move away. And again I cried out to them, Jack, Susan, listen to me. You've got to hear me. You've got to. But they didn't turn. They didn't hear. They couldn't. They were alive. And I was dead. At last, despairing, I turned. And there was Mr. Benedict again, watching me, his deep-set eyes expressionless. Gregory Raymond, do you believe at last? Are you convinced now that there can be no communication? No, no, there must be. Yogi Krishna proved it to me. He was a trickster, seeking money from you. The most heartless kind of trickster, preying on your hope. I don't believe it. You must resign yourself to the truth. We are not unkind. We do not wish you to be tormented unnecessarily. Come with me. I shall show you. He took me by the hand and led me across the room. A door opened silently before we reached it and shut behind us as we passed through. We went down a corridor and came to a small room where a girl sat at a desk, typing. We entered, and she did not look up. She is typing the necessary documents concerning your burial tomorrow, Gregory Raymond. Do you wish to speak to her? Yes, yes, I do. Young lady, listen to me. I'm Gregory Raymond, here, standing beside you. She does not hear you. You don't have to answer me. Just, uh, just stop typing. Anything to show that you know that I'm speaking to you. You see? Now come, we shall try further. We continued down the hallway, and we came to another room. In this one, a man sat. We paused in the doorway and watched him. He was telephoning. Well, uh, obituary editor, this is the Stonefield Chapel calling. Will you run an announcement, please, saying that services for the late Gregory Raymond will be held Thursday at 4 o'clock? That is correct. From the chapel. Um, well, only the family will be present. Thank you. You may try to speak to him if you wish. My friend, can you hear me? Please, just look around. Oh, hello, evening, Ledger. Uh, the obituary editor, please. Please, you must hear me. You must. I have to let the world know all that I've learned. Oh, hello, obituary editor. This is the Stonefield Chapel calling. Will you take down an announcement, please? Oh, all right. Yes, I'll wait. He cannot hear. But perhaps someone else may. We will try again, if you wish. Oh, yes, yes, I do. Someone, somewhere, will be able to hear me. We went on down the corridor, and another door opened before us. We stepped through onto green lawn. Mr. Benedict led me across it through a little gate and into a small cemetery that lay hushed in the shade of great trees. There, two men were digging. We paused beside them. Do you know what they're digging, Gregory Raymond? Yes, a grave. Your grave, where your earthly body shall rest while you roam the world unseen, unheard. Oh, no, oh, no. Speak to them. See if they can hear you. I will. You two men, listen to me. I'm Gregory Raymond. Do you hear? They do not hear. You've got to listen to me. Just give me some sign that you hear something. Just stop digging for a minute. Anything... You see? They do not pause. Thus it must be always. Your punishment is to remain here on this earthly plane. A lonely soul without hope. Oh, no. Oh, no, I couldn't bear that. Take me with you. I don't care what happens to me, but don't leave me here like this. I'm sorry. It cannot be otherwise. But what have I done? 
What am I being punished for? You know. I do not need to tell you. You mean because I killed my brother? That is for you to say, not for me to judge. I did. I did kill him. I pushed him off the cliff when he refused the money that I asked for. Are you confessing to his murder, Gregory Raymond? Yes, yes, I am. I killed him. It was an impulse. I didn't plan to do it. But I'm sorry now. Punish me any way you want, only don't leave me here like this. Very well, Gregory Raymond. You shall be punished. An earthly punishment according to the laws of men. What do you mean? You two, you can stop digging now. Well, uh, you heard Gregory Raymond confess to the murder of his brother? Well, all right, Lieutenant Benedict. We're sure glad it's over. These pickaxes are giving us blisters. They... they hurt us. Yes, Mr. Raymond. Now you're under arrest for murder. Under arrest? But that is impossible. I'm afraid it is. You see, I'm Lieutenant Benedict of the Homicide Squad. You're not dead. You're very much alive. No, I can't be. You're lying. I'm afraid we played a little trick on you. Out here in Hollywood, we have some very good actors, and, uh... Well, you see, your nephew arranged the whole thing with actors, wax figures and coffins, and weird atmosphere to see if we couldn't get a confession out of you. No, I don't believe you. He figured you had such a one-track mind on the subject of death. When you knocked yourself unconscious, he decided to try and convince you you'd killed yourself. No. It looks as though he succeeded better than we'd hoped. Now... Will you come quietly, Mr. Raymond? No. You can't arrest me. You can't arrest a dead man. And I'm dead. I know I am. I died last night. again. Oh, you want to know whether Gregory really was dead or not? Well, it became a matter of some dispute. The doctors said he was alive, and he insisted he was dead. They argued back and forth, and neither side could convince the other. You know how it is when neither side will give in. To this day, nobody has convinced Gregory that he's really alive. It's probably the strangest punishment a man ever suffered. Which uh, brings me to my story for next week, S.O.S. It's about three men who find themselves in the most dreadful predicament any man has. It. Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. I'm sure we meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. Just heard The Mysterious Traveler, played by Maurice Tarflett. Others in our cast were Brett Morrison, Eric Dressler, Bryna Rayburn, and Jack Curtis. All characters in this story were fictitious, and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. Original music, played by Milton Kay. Grayson Enlow speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.